हेलो हेलो Good afternoon and welcome to the Professor Sayyid Mohideen Shah Endowment Lecture. Let us begin this occasion of enlightenment with a prayer. I request all the dignitaries and the audience to please rise for the prayer. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Iqra' bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. خلق الإنسان من علق إكره وربك الأكرم الذي علم بالقلم علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم كلا In the name of God, most beneficent, most merciful. Read, in the name of your Lord, who created. He created man from a clot of blood. Read, your Lord is most generous. He taught the use of pen. He taught man what he did not know. But man crosses the limits. I once again welcome one and all to this auspicious event. I would like to invite the choir for the college song. Hello, Chick. Hello. Hello, Chick.
thank you, Coir, for that beautiful rendition. Now, I request one and all to please turn your eyes to the screen as we display the profile video of Farooq College, followed by an informational video on Professor Saeed Mohideen Shah, the very first principal of Farooq College. Farooq College, a significant landmark that triggered the renaissance of Kerala, was established in 1948 under the guidance of Maulana Abu Sabah Ahmed Ali, who, with like-minded people, laid the foundation of Rausatul Uloom Association. Farooq College was recognized as a minority institution in 2009 and conferred autonomous status in 2015. is the pioneer in higher education, being the largest residential campus in Kerala with over 4,000 students and 150 faculties. The college has been placed at the highest grade in all its three cycles of NAC accreditation and ranked in the cluster of first 100 colleges of NIRF in the country since 2019. We have a beautiful campus with amazing infrastructure and facilities and when it comes to the teaching faculty, definitely they are well experienced, supportive and a bunch of excellencies. It is the first college under the University of Calicut to be identified by the UGC as a college with potential for excellence and continued to be recognized with assistance under the FIST program of the Department of Science and Technology, the Government of India. Faru College provides different platforms for students to exhibit and showcase their talents. Now, apart from fine arts and annual cultural celebrations, they also provide us with certain clubs, under which there is music club, dance club and theatre club. Faru College provides excellent infrastructure for teaching learning, research, sports and arts, and other extension activities to enrich the campus community. Under Kaliki University Championships, we have been able to win many zonal trophies and produce champions. The college also enrolls foreign students under the Indian Council for Cultural Relations and the Study in India program sponsored by the Government of India. Studying in India was my dream. I feel very proud that I am a student of Aru College. People here are very friendly and teachers are professional. College got re-accreditation with an A-plus level in 2016 with a CGPA of 3.51 on a four-point scale. The Abu Sabah Library Complex is one of the best libraries in the state of Kerala with an invaluable collection of books, periodicals, CDs and other audiovisual aids. Faru College is the first aided campus to house a health center. The college is also the foremost institution to provide its share of social commitment with its pain and palliative clinic, dialysis center and PM Institute of Civil Services examinations. Faru College Old Students Association FOSA, with its 14 overseas chapters, cherishes a strong bond with the college through their constant support for infrastructural projects, students' welfare programs, and extension activities.
Farooq College has turned out to be an important landmark in the educational scenario of Kerala. With its rich tradition, recognitions and strength, the college is constantly heading towards higher echelons of excellence, leaving footprints in the sands of time. in Trishur, the cultural capital of Kerala, Professor Sweet Mohideen Shah was a luminary in the realm of education. His impactful journey included pivotal roles as the principal of MSM College of Arts, Kayankulam, and TKM College of Arts, Kilon. During 1964 to 1967, breaking new ground, Professor Shah became the first dean of the Faculty of Arts at Calicut University from 1968 to 1973. His contributions extended beyond academia, serving as the director of the Institute of Mapla Studies, convener of Kerala Islamic Seminar, and more. Professor Said Mohitin Shah's legacy shines brightest at Faru College, where he served as its first principal from 1948 to 1955. Facing economic challenges, he transformed Faru College into an academic powerhouse, introducing science subjects and pioneering BSc and BCom programs. His dedication extended to government sectors, founding Modapalli College and Kayankulam College, leaving and a everlasting impact. A prolific scholar, Professor Shah was the chief editor of Islamic Darshanam and authored the enlightening volume Islam in Kerala. Professor Sayyid Muhyiddin Shah's demise on April 6, 1988 marked the end of the era, but his legacy lives on through the countless minds he nurtured and enlightened. Join us in celebrating the life and contributions of a visionary educator whose influence continues to shape the landscape of education. This is the legacy of Professor Saint Muhyiddin Shah Sahib. I request, I request Dr. K. Dr. K. Rizwana Sultana, Head of the Head Department of, of English, English, to welcome to today's welcome gathering. gathering. Ma'am, please. Ma please. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's with it's immense with pleasure, pleasure that I stand, that I stand before, you before you on the special, special occasion dedicated, dedicated to the memory, to the memory of, of, of founder, founder principal, principal Professor Sayyid Mohitin Shah through the inauguration of the endowment lecture. Professor Sayyid Mohitin Shah laid the groundwork for Faru College, shaped it into an institution of academic brilliance as envisaged and envisioned by the founders. It is a tribute to the enduring principles that our founder principal held dear commitment to education, pursuit of knowledge, and the belief in the transformative power of ideas. The pursuit of knowledge is a journey that transcends time, and today's lecture is a step forward in that journey. Dr. Jay Kumar is known to all for his service to the state as uh, an IAS officer, and also and as also a poet, as a poet author, author, lyricist, lyricist translator, translator, and screenwriter. And, screenwriter. and, uh, and uh, I, I say it say here, it sir, here, sir, that, uh, that uh, one of your translated works is, in, is uh, included uh, uh, to, to uh, the uh, syllabus, syllabus of our BA Malayalam, Malayalam language, and language and literature. And literature. He is he also is he also, has also he has served also as, served the, founding as the founding vice chancellor of Malayalam University. University. And with and all with pride all and honor, let me welcome, welcome you to the, the event, event, sir. Event, sir.
Janapi Ahmed. Ahmed. President, President Managing Committee is, is a person of, of brilliance, brilliance, brilliance and, and ever, ever energetic person who inspires us to get along with all our academic and non-academic endowers. With all love and honor, we welcome you, sir. And our beloved principal, Dr. Aisha Sopnaki, who is a source of beacon for all our endeavors. I welcome you, ma'am. Dr. Sayyid Yusuf Shah, son of our founder principal, Sayyid Mohideen Shah. We are immensely grateful to you, sir, that you have reminded us for this wonderful event, which we will be organizing every year, and you have given it a start. Dr. Sayyid Yusuf Shah, currently he is Director to International Institute of Adult and Lifelong Education, New Delhi. I welcome you, sir. And his and family, his family Dr. Dr. Naseem Shah, Naseem Shah, Naseem Shah uh, uh, doctor, doctor retired, retired from, from AIMS, AIMS New Delhi, Delhi, is amongst us, amongst us to share the to love share and pride of Faru College. College. On behalf, On of, behalf Faru of Faru Fraternity, Faru Fraternity, 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 I welcome, I welcome you, ma'am. Hearty welcome to the members of our Managing Committee, uh, Janab, uh, Dr. Ali Faisal, Joint Secretary, Management Committee for the College. I welcome you, sir. Our former principal, Professor Kutel Kuti, who has been a source of energy and motivation for us for many long years as a professor at the college and also as principal for a long tenure. Uh, on behalf of uh, the entire Farooq fraternity, sir, I welcome you to the event. Now, um, K. Kunyalagi, sir, sir, Vice President, President Faru College, College Management, Management Committee, Committee is, uh, is uh, again as a source of inspiration, of inspiration as he is not just uh, a, uh, a me uh, um, member of the Management, of the management Committee, Committee, he is he also is a also former student, student of the college, of the and, college and he is the one, one who carries college, college uh, uh, as a as pride and a heart. Uh, with uh, all, all uh, pride, and pride and happiness, I happiness welcome you, sir, on, on behalf of the fraternity. And, uh, and uh, I welcome uh, all the all former the principals, principals who have uh, accepted, uh, accepted our, invitation our invitation and have come, and have come over here. here. I extend, I extend my, my gratitude, gratitude and my, and my heartfelt, heartfelt welcome, welcome to, to all the former, all the former professors, professors, veterans, veterans who have served, served, served the college for college many, for many years, years, and, uh, and the heads uh, of the institutions, the institutions uh, our sister, uh, sister institutions, institutions, a hearty welcome, hearty welcome. and, uh, and uh, a, welcome a welcome to, to all my all colleagues, my colleagues here, here and Faru College, College and all my dear all students, my students, students, and a special, and a special welcome, welcome to the organizing committee from the, from the Department of English of and Chemistry. Chemistry. Thank, you Thank you all. Thank you Thank you, ma'am. Ma I invite Janab P. K. Ahmed, President, Managing Committee, Faru College, for the presidential address. So please. Distinguished, 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 guest of honor, guest of honor, Dr. Diego Marayes, Professor, Professor Yusuf Shah, Yusuf Shah, Dr. Nesim Shah, 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 Shah,
Secretary for Rural College, Dr. Ali Faisal. Principal, Dr. Aisha Sopna. Former Principal, Kutali Gubisai. My Mr. Kunyal Gubisai. Vice President, Padu College. Esteemed, my name and committee members. All other dignities, on end of the day. Very good afternoon to all. It is indeed an honor to see this gathering. You are here to remember and honor our beloved former principal, Professor Mohideen Shah, who had left indelible imprints on the success story of Falu College. Today, it is an honor to extend my heartful thanks to appreciation to the organizers, organizers, the principal, faculty members, Especially, Especially Professor Yusuf Shah, Shah, Shah for taking, for taking the, initiative the initiative to dedicate this day, this day in memory of in the memory great of the Professor Mohideen Shah. Shah. Professor Yusuf Shah, 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 your commitment, your commitment to, honoring to honoring your father's, your father's legacy, father's legacy through, this through this endowment lecture, 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 lecture is both is touching both and touching commendable. commendable. Your support your and support involvement, involvement have made, have made this, event this event even more meaningful. I must add that your gesture has not only made this lecture feasible, feasible, but has also added immense value to our academic community. And to have the eminent Dr. Jayakumar, and to have the eminent, eminent Dr. Jayakumar sir to deliver the endowment lecture. Indeed, adds Indeed, great, great value, value, value and beauty to the beauty occasion. occasion. I am sure that it sure sure talks, talks on navigating the future, exploring the higher the education, education prospect on the 20th century, 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 will gift useful insights further to further vision and mission of Faru College. Dr. Jagumar, sir. Career is an Indian civil service, Indian civil servant, chief secretary of the government of Kerala, poet, author, there is it, screenwriter, and translator. Has been nothing short of. He was the first vice chancellor of the Malayalam University. He is varied experiences, experiences, and deep insights insight into working in our society, society. make him make him the perfect guide to navigate the ever-changing ever -changing landscape, landscape of the higher education. The higher, education. higher education has changed a lot, a lot over time. Over time. And Faru College has done it well and is gone creating Capable, capable individuals, individuals ready to face ready the challenges, challenges that the society, society now faces. Now. Our college Our works, college works hard, to hard to groom, groom community, community, community where the stakeholders grow morally, 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 spiritually, spiritually, spiritually intellectually, intellectually, and physically. And physically. We have over 3,000 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, students studying here. here. We tend to undergrad. undergrad. One indicator, One indicator and, 15 and 15 postgraduate. postgraduate Progress, progress, program, program, eleven, eleven, eleven. Our, our PG department, 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 are known as a research center, focusing, focusing on exploring, exploring new, ideas. new ideas. ideas. Our, our campus is dedicated, dedicated teachers, teachers who are dedicated, dedicated in the career, in the career. Helping, helping students to grow into, grow into responsible, responsible citizens. citizens. Our goal is to provide students this space of space with space where they can improve their creative and thinking skills and their goals to life and support research. Our mission has always been always to prepare our students to face challenges, think critically and contribute positively to the world to the world. Faru College Faru always, always, always realized realize, 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 on his past glory to, to mark to march to march to march towards it towards is a better future. And the endowment lecture today is another milestone to this direction.
It is truly inspiring to witness the collective and effort put forth by the organizers to bring together the enriching event. Your dedication and hard work in arranging such a thought-provoking thought lecture are truly commendable. This gathering stands as a, as a testament to the power of unity and collaboration in forthcoming education and knowledge. Thank you once again, every involved, every, every, everyone involved, your effective have certainly made the lasting impact and we look forward to many more insightful lectures in future. Thank you, Jai Hind, thank you. Thank you, sir. I invite Dr. Aisha Swapna K.A., the principal of Faru College, to address the gathering. Ma'am, please. Respected President of the Management Committee, Mr. P.K. Ahmad, the Chief Guest of today, Dr. K. J. Kumar, and of course, the dynamos or the energy forces of today's endowment lecture, Professor Dr. S. Y. Shah and his very adorable spouse, Dr. Naseem Shah, other management committee members, Mr. Kunyalavi, Dr. Ali Faisal, former principal Kutyaligudi sir, and the head of the departments of English and chemistry who were instrumental in organizing this event. The retired staff, my fellow colleagues from sister institutions, my dear staff and all the members who are attending this particular endowment session. This is indeed a landmark. Just two months ago, I received a call from Dr. S. Y. Shah and it was indeed an opening or an awakening for all of us. In fact, it was routed through the English department and our former professor, Professor Munavra ma'am, and her husband, Mr. Khadar, who were instrumental in organizing this event. When I started conversation with Sayyid uh, Yusuf Shah sir, little did I know that we were actually beginning something new, something really remarkable. And along with the end of that particular phone call, I was digging into history, I was digging into the background of uh, Farooq College, and what came up was even more astounding. Everyone hears about the causative person or our dear, or dear Maulavi Sahib, Abu Sabah Maulavi, who was the one who actually gave resources, space and other things to Farooq College. And Farooq College came into being. But have we really realized that even with the thought or with the committee, what happens to an institution is triggered by actions of a whole lot of team and the one who was instrumental in uh, channelizing or formulating the funds and others, according to my historical research, happens to be none other than Sayyid Mohideen Shah. And it is with great pride that we are standing in front of his, uh, uh, his lovely family and starting this experience of endowment lecture. Now, according to S.Y. Shah, he is only too happy to uh, trigger this uh, endowment lecture in his father's name. Now, what the, the parent uh, did to the institution is something which I think is even unknown to uh, the son and the daughter-in-law who are seated on the stage. Because I was informing him about a casual reference about how Professor Ayub, the librarian of our college, happened to start a, a chain reaction. And the chain reaction is none other than the Department of Library Science and the lovely team of uh, teachers who have started a scholarship program in Sayyid Mohideen Shah's name. 
And I think the entire campus and all, entire fraternity is unaware of this. And equally surprised were the duo when I informed them. Now that is the love and a special affection that we have for the first principle. And as we proceed, whatever we trigger in the name of this esteemed soul, Professor Sayyid Mohideen Shah, he is something like a beacon for everyone to reach up to. Today we are sitting in this humble abode that we call as Farukabad with all these facilities, this auditorium, the other academic blocks and so on. But when the college started in 1948, nothing of that was there. Today, the teachers of this college enjoy salary as fund and grant. But during those days, there was no salary as such from any sort of source. It was Professor Mohideen Shah who used to go around, talk to people, convince them about the mission and vision of Faru College and bring in funds. In fact, every month it was a huge task for him to bring in salary for the teachers who worked in Farooq College. So that was him. And not only that, when the other facilities and uh, you know, uh, rooms were developed, his hand was seen in every aspect of the same. So this is Mo Sayyid Mohideen Shah for all of us. And we are indeed fortunate that Professor S.Y. Shah and his spouse, Dr. Naseem Shah, who is also the head and professor uh, retired from Ames uh, Department of Dental Surgery, who are present today. And uh, according to the information, his siblings and uh, you know two or three generations are online watching us uh, through a live stream. Because of uh, geographical locations, they are unable to join us. But on behalf of the Farooq College fraternity, I am deeply acknowledging our gratitude and happiness for you and your family in having begun this uh, reaction or chain reaction. Now, Farooq College is moving forward towards another world, a world wherein we are moving towards the border of not just academic uh, you know, fraternities, but beyond into a digital surface, a digital university scenario. And at that moment, I think we need to actually look into the background, the history also, because without learning from history, without learning from experience, I think we at Farooq College will never learn anything. So this is actually a lesson for all of us. And on behalf of Farooq College, I am indebted to everyone who is actually assembled over here and who is eager to witness this endowment lecture. Equally fortunate is Farooq College in having such an eminent chief guest. Now, Dr. K. J. Kumar, if I happen to introduce, that would be a big uh, offense because Dr. K. J. Kumar is so well known to everyone in uh, the academia and in the community. So on behalf of Farooq College, I think I must, on an official note, express our gratitude for uh, you having expect, uh, accepted this uh, uh, opportunity. Uh, and it is also significant that we have such a, a resourceful person, such an eminent scholar, to begin this pioneering endowment lecture series in the name of uh, Professor Sayyid Mohideen Shah. Now, to the presence of the management, when the name of Dr. K. J. Kumar was mentioned, our president was immediately on alert because the chief guest happens to be a very dear friend and soul to our president and the managing committee. And on this occasion, uh, on behalf of everyone uh, seated here in front of us, the entire community, we welcome each and every one of you to this event. With a further ado, let's actually proceed on with the endowment lecture series. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you, ma'am. Now, I invite Janab P.K. Ahmed, President, Managing Committee of Faru College, to adorn our chief guest of the day, Dr. K. Jayakumar with a panada. So please.
Now, I request Mr. K. Kunelavi, Vice President, Managing Committee of our college, to honor Dr. Saeed Yusuf Shah, son of Professor Saeed Mahideen Shah, by adorning him with a panada. Sir, please. Thank you, sirs. Dr. K. J. Kumar Ayes, a multifaceted personality whose illustrious career as an Indian Administrative Service Officer has left an indelible mark. Beyond all his academic and administrative excellence, K. J. Kumar extends his prowess into the realms of poetry, literature, songwriting, translation, screenwriting, and whatnot. As you already know, his contributions echo in the melodies of numerous beautiful Malayalam songs that grace our daily lives, making his presence today even more special. Here, I welcome Dr. K. Jayakumar Ayes for the inaugural address and endowment lecture. Sir, please. President of the Management Committee, my old associate and friend, Shpikya Ahmad, Dr. Saeed Yusuf Shah, who is instrumental in bringing us all together, his wife, Dr. Naseem Shah, Principal of the College, Dr. Aisha Swapna, Dr. Kunyalavi, Dr. Ali Faisal, Kuti Ali Kuti, Dr. Iswana Sultan, who, who, Sultana, who introduced us or welcomed us, distinguished faculty, former uh, teachers, other guests, and my dear students. I should thank you for, uh, I should thank the college and the family of Professor Saeed Mohideen Shah for bestowing upon me the honor of being invited to deliver the first Saeed Mohideen Shah endowment lecture. Actually, when I was called, I little did I realize that this is the first lecture. I thought it is a continuing lecture and this year the lot happened, it came to me. But I was really overwhelmed. I was rather uh, uh, overjoyed when I learned that I have the privilege of inaugurating these lectures, which I'm sure will continue for several years as an opportunity to recall the services of Sayyid Mahdeep Mohideen Shah, as well as to rededicate ourselves to the values that he cherished. Any endowment lecture for that matter is an opportunity to relive the past as well as to rededicate to the future. Without rededicating to the future, any such exercise has no meaning. Putting it differently, even as we become nostalgic about the people who went ahead of us, it is equally important to learn lessons from them so that we can use them effectively to improve our future. So that way, this endowment lecture is extremely thoughtful. And I should, I should um, compliment Dr. Syed Yusuf Shah for uh, coming out with this idea. And it has been so destined that I am the first one to come here and to give this commemoration lecture. Um, Dr. Shah was, um, Professor uh, Said Mohideen Shah was principal here 
for seven years, up to 1955. And he was the first principal. You see, there is something common I am trying to establish between him and my life. Although I was only three years old when he was principal here, or when he left as principal here, because I was born in 1952. But I can empathize with him, or rather, uh, I can visualize the initial years as principal of a new college. Because I had the opportunity, or the privilege, or the suffering, <laughs> to be the first registrar of one university, that is today's Mahatma Gandhi University, which was then called Gandhiji University, where I was the registrar, first registrar, I think that was way back in 1983, 83 or 84, if I'm not mistaken. When I was posted as registrar, the new university, the present Mahatma Gandhi University, which is one of the best universities in Kerala today, was housed in a school, in Baker Memorial School in Kota. It was an abandoned school, so Vice Chancellor Dr. A.T. Devasya was sitting in a room, Dr. Professor Koshi, the PVC, was sitting in another room, and uh, there were a few other rooms with few people, and I occupied the third room. But how to occupy it? There are no chairs. So I went to the Godrej showroom opposite the, uh, uh, the, the school and bought a chair and a table. Then the Vice Chancellor said, you will be inviting audit objection because you have, invi you have bought the chair and table without inviting quotations. I said then the option would be to sit on the floor. Registrar sitting on the floor is not a very uh, encouraging thing or rather it's not a very comfortable thing. Therefore, let us face it. So from then, the travails of being the first vice chancellor or the first registrar of a university, I have understood the, the, the complex issues, administrative issues as well as academic issues that confront uh, the first of first administrators. That way. Then again, I also did not realize at that time, or little did I realize in 1983, that God was preparing me for even worse things. <laughs> when I retired in 2012 as the Chief Secretary of Kerala, the government, the then government decided that I will go and uh, start Malayalam University in Thirur. So next day I went, I retired on October 31st and 1st of November 2012, we started Malayalam University. And I assumed the charge of Vice Chancellor. How? The then Chief Minister came, a lot of people came. We had a stone engraved and uh, we sort of unveiled the stone and uh, Malayalam University came into being. There was no space, there was no house, there was no place to go. So I went to MD Vasudevan Nayas Tunjan Parambu. That was where the function took place. I took a paper and uh, wrote to the governor, the chancellor, saying that this is to inform your excellency that I have assumed today as the vice chancellor of Malayalam University in the forenoon of 1st November 2012. There was a fax machine. It was faxed to Rajbhavan. So in the afternoon, I did not know what to do. I had a room in the rest house, so I went and slept. So when I woke up, I said to myself, look, you did not come to Thiru to just sleep in the afternoon. You have to establish a university. And how do you go about it? So I rang up the, the MLA and said that I am new to Thiru. Give me somebody who knows Thiru, the people of Thiru. So he gave me one person, one fellow called uh, Siraj. I still remember him. He is still with the university. And I think we too started the university. <laughs> In the sense, we start from the scratch. From buying the paper to write about, write on, your furniture, your office, renting out, a, getting a house on rent for your office, acquiring furniture, your computer, your stationery, your uh, logo, everything, everything. In fact, I had to write a book on that, I suppose. I was waiting for sufficient time for me to separate from those days so that I can look at those things objectively without any emotion entanglements. So I think now it is nearly six, seven years. So I think now it is time for me to recall all those things. 
Now, why I say all these things is the first principle of a college would have undergone equally or even more because the time was even more, 1948. 1948 to 1955, they were not very prosperous years for anyone, for the country, for the state. People are struggling with a, with a public cause and I can understand the kind of difficulties Professor Shah would have encountered in setting up this, uh, this college. You see, the first authority of any college or a university will definitely leave his imprint uh, in the destiny of that institution. His personality will last. That is because the institution has been uh, sort of designed in such a way that it will foster excellence. He could have created an institution with a different template, in which case Faru College would not, would not have scaled the scale the glory that it has scaled today because even in the initial years Faru College has been committed to excellence and to greater achievement and and he was extremely aware about the social commitment that this college upholds and the academic excellence that this college has always espoused. I think credit goes to the first principal who has sort of set the target, set the tangent. You see after all when we start on a journey it is a tangent that decides, de determines your, uh, where you reach. You can turn right, left or uh, back, or backwards or whatever it is. The tangent that the principal decides is what decides the destiny and fate of an institution. So I think it was his vision, it was his leadership, it was his commitment, it was his scholarship, everything that went into the designing of the, of the trajectory that Faru College has subsequently taken in the last so many years of its wonderful existence. So I think we should, we should pay our homage to him for his visionary leadership in having developed an institution which could build on what he has created. And if the base, if the foundation is not strong, your superstructure cannot, cannot be, be as powerful as it is today. Therefore, let us pay our homage uh, by, by remembering with fondness and gratitude the great contribution he has done in laying the very strong foundation stone which can withstand or which is powerful enough for any kind of superstructure that we are trying to build. So I think my humble homage to Professor Said Mohuddin Shah. And I should also uh, sort of honor his son, his family, for thinking about instituting a memorial endowment lecture which will give us an opportunity to talk about him, remember him, and pay homage year after year, as well as spend some time not only thinking about the past, but also thinking about the future. After all, life is all about future, isn't it? It's not about past. Past is all memory. So the memory should inspire us to look towards future and travel uh, in the right direction in future. So let his memory inspire us to, to steer a course which will take us to greater heights in the days to come. Therefore, very thoughtfully, um, a subject has been suggested to me to talk today, uh, navigating the future, exploring higher education prospects in the 21st century. After all, when uh, Professor Shah started this college, he had a vision. That vision was founded with a kind of background in which the college came into being. And what was that background? Nascent, nascently independent India nascently independent India, with all inherited problems, with a vision about the future inspiring the generation, isn't it? Much more than it inspires us today. So it was in that glowing, glowing morning of independence that this institution came into being. Now today, we are in the 21st century. We are, remo we are removed from those days, 1948 to 2023, around 75 years have elapsed. So 75 years have done remarkable changes, have brought about remarkable changes in, our, in the ways we think, in the way we think, in the way we do business. In, the, in, in, all, in all aspects, things have changed. India of 1948, world of 1948 no longer exists. We are in the first quarter of the 21st century and therefore uh, spending a few minutes on the prospects or the challenges of education in the 21st century is perhaps a sequel, a timely sequel to what Professor Shah must have undergone or 
what he must have thought in the initial days of this college. What is the quality of education? What is the kind of education that is going to be in the next 50 years? That is what must have gone through their minds, the, the initial uh, people, the people who developed this institution, including the principal. They must have given the very same thoughts. What is the kind of education that is appropriate for our country, for our society? And so that is what we should give to, the, give to our students. I think the same, we are also in the same, uh, same context today when we are confronted with a different historical situation when technology, when changes, when economic changes, global changes, global politics, everything is changing and we are looking into a, at the same time certain, at the same time certain as well as uncertain future. Our future is certain, at the same time it is uncertain. I might sound uh, uh, sort of baffling or rather uh, ambiguous, but in a way we know what our future is going to be, at the same time it is riddled with uncertainties. Political uncertainties are there, at the same time environmental uncertainties are there, Climate change is a fact to reckon with. COP, Committee of uh, uh, Nations, which are meeting, uh, Committee of Parties as they call, the environmental uh, international conferences being held year after year or periodically, people meet, greet and pass resolutions and go away, but nothing is happening in our lives which promises, uh, which gives us promise to live in a better world. Only resolutions are there. So the uncertain, environmental uncertainty, ecological, ecological uncertainty is a certainty. Ecological uncertainty is a certainty because your, uh, our uh, remedial measures are still in the realm of negotiation. Nothing really is happening. Our lives have not changed pro-environment. No, our lifestyles have not changed in favor of an environmental friendly lifestyle. I think we. We, we keep on celebrating our lives as we did in the beginning of the century or even the last decades of the century. Western world has been living in this style for so many years and the resultant effect is what is being seen in the environment and in your ozone layer and all these things. And we are witnessing climate change in our day-to-day -day life. That is certain. As I said, an uncertain climate future is the only certainty that is confronting us. Political uncertainties are plaguing the world. We really do not know two wars are going on in the world today. We really don't know what, what are going to be the outcomes. So there is a bit of uncertainty. At the same time, there are certain, there are certain certainties. For example, one of the big major certainty is that technology is going to bring in more and more competencies into the world. Mankind is going to have more and more technological skills and technological uh, capabilities which is, you cannot reverse the technological progress because everybody has an interest in it and the world itself is becoming a better place that way thanks to technology. Therefore, technological innovations and technological advancements is a certainty, but to what, to what purpose these technological innovations will be put to is an uncertainty. That is why I said our future is riddled with certainties as well as uncertainties. I'm not sounding like a vague modern poet or a postmodern poet, but, but that is what, that is how it can be expressed. We are living in a juncture where our future is certain as well as uncertain. That is where we, have, we are talking about the education of the 21st, education of the 21st century, the future. You see, our future itself or whatever we have achieved today, the technological and scientific advancements in the area of medicine, in the area of everyday, all aspects of life are touched with technological innovations. Now, who has created it? What has created it? All the facilities that we enjoy today, it is the knowledge that has generated all these changes, isn't it? The knowledge, that is why we say it's a knowledge-driven society and it is the knowledge that has given us better medicines or better facilities, better travel, better, all kinds of better things in life today are generated as a result of greater knowledge. And this knowledge has come from education, isn't it? Higher education is the producer of this knowledge. And uh, the knowledge that has been produced by higher education has created an environment where things are improved. There are a lot of opportunities before us. Technological options are immense. And at the same time, it is a reiterating cycle. Knowledge has produced this technology or education has produced this technology and this life today. And these technological innovations are impacting education itself. It's a reiterating cycle. 
the society that has been created as a result of technological innovations is also impacting our classrooms, our education system. And that education is again impacting the knowledge and that knowledge is creating technology. So this, it is an upward spiral, it is going up. From the classrooms only, knowledge comes out. From the laboratories, from the, your PhD programs, from your research, new, new ideas are generated, new knowledge is generated, and that new knowledge is translated into technology, and that is impacting our lives. And all these things are impacting the classroom. So it is an upwardly moving spiral. That is what true education is all about. When um, Nobel Prizes are declared, we vainly look into the list. Is there any Indian somewhere there? You know? Is there any Malayali anywhere there? Nowhere, nowhere to be seen because there are, because I don't know to answer because, but it is almost certain that either Europeans or Japanese or, the, or Americans bag all the Nobel Prizes for chemistry or physics or medicine or, uh, you know, economics. Economics, sometimes it comes to India also, but then uh, all these scientific innovations, who takes the prize, all these uh, uh, Western world uh, gra grabs all the, uh, the accolades of scientific innovation. It is a reflection on the quality and nature of our education or their education that makes them eligible to be in the forefront of technological innovations or knowledge innovations. It is a reflection on the quality of education. Now, I would like to ask, uh, what is our contribution? What is the contribution of Indian education in furthering the frontiers of knowledge in the world. We will say that, yes, our people are all working in uh, uh, Silicon Valley. Yes, of course. But are they studying, are they utilizing the knowledge that they have captured from our classrooms? I doubt. They are there. I also went to California two months ago. A lot of Indians. And actually, Americans are slightly scared of Indians also because Indian brains are too versatile. They will grasp it in, in no time. Because we are, you know, hard, we, are, we, have, we have grown up in a very hard, uh, against hard uh, climate, hard conditions. So we are not accustomed to too much of comfort. So we can sort of struggle and get to the top. Actually, Americans are scared of Indians. I should say in technology, in, in Apple and Google and uh, uh, Microsoft and all these giants, Indians, particularly Indians, are looked upon with fair amount of suspicion because they are very good. And their capabilities, my only question is, I am very happy that Indians are being looked upon with great amount of respect and uh, even suspicion or whatever because of their competence and capabilities. But my question is, how did they acquire these capabilities? Are these capabilities a continuation of what they have learned from our classrooms? I doubt. That is my fundamental question that I have to discuss before you. Uh, anyway, we'll come back. As I said, education impacts technology and technology impacts education. We are confronted, living in 21st century, we are confronted with a technology which is such a foundational technology, maybe which can be compared only with the, with the advent of electricity. It is, the, it is the invention of electricity which has changed the world, isn't it? Without electricity, we can't think about anything. Without electricity, we cannot, in, we cannot think about a world without electricity. Because so many things, things work only with electricity. So elect, invention of electricity was one inflection point in human history. The next inflection point seems to be digital technologies. Humankind and human history is going to change. The artificial intelligence that we talk about today with trepidation will be looked upon as child's play in the next 20 years. The great chat GPT which we are talking about, which can bring about results in half a second, 20 seconds, will be looked upon as child's play in the next 25 years. In any case, the generation who is going to live in 2050 are going to look upon us in the 20s and 30s and said that look upon, look at the, the kind of mobile phones they used to have, brick-like. They might be using something which we can't invite, which we don't know how it is going to happen. The kind of blending and uh, the kind of 
dynamics that is taking that are taking place in the world of technology is beyond our imagination the only un, the only certain thing is that whatever predictions you make will be wrong that is all you can predict you cannot predict technology has any technology pre uh, gone according to what we have predicted all these books people write about science tomorrow and all that. the only prediction is it all be gone, all, all be proved wrong technology has its own dynamics and therefore we are in a situation where we are confronted with a technological milieu that is affecting that has been affecting all our lives all aspects of our life i don't have to explain that is there any aspect of our life which is not controlled or influenced by technology everything you even uh, you, there are certain there are hotels where the the lights come out automatically because there are sensors because they don't want to waste electricity there are sensors you go along and then the lights come you go off and the lights go off it is small innovation simple innovation child's innovation but anywhere when i went to san francisco recently i saw a ghost car going because it's a driverless car i was scared i was it looked like a eerie picture you know a, a car roaming around the city without anybody in it car is going to fetch somebody some, from a hotel to drop him in the airport somebody has uh, keyed in and the car will come and stop at the lounge of a hotel the, the portico of a hotel he will get in pay the money and he will drop at terminal number 2 of san francisco airport money is paid and then he gets a call and goes so a ghost car going up and down you and i cannot imagine but the new generation in san francisco are very happy with that you don't you can talk anything in the car because there is no driver to eavesdrop you know, all kinds of things and it is safer because a driver who is high on drugs is more risky than a driverless car driverless car is very safe because his mood is not a not a variable whether he had an overdose of liquor yesterday is not a variable it's very simple it's a safest car i'm sure in another 10 years people will only hire driverless car because it's a safest car so that is the way technology is changing now coming back to our classrooms the crucial question is so whatever i said so far is only to tell you that we are living in a fast changing world in a uncertainly a, the, the course of changes we really don't know but we only know that changes are taking place at a very fast pace and the way the way, way we do business way we do every aspect of our life is being impacted by technology now the question is is our education system keeping pace with these changes now i come to my subject so far it has been only preparation for the subject is our education systems system keeping pace with the the pace of changes that are taking place in the world today after all a student who is sitting in a bsc physics class, physics class or in a chemistry class or any classroom for that matter we are preparing him for the 2024 examination but then he is being prepared not for the life of 2024 he has to get inspired he has to get trained for the life of 2027 28 or 30s he has to bloom himself into a very useful person with his knowledge his knowledge should be useful to the society in the next 10 years or 15 years we are actually grooming him for the next decade isn't it we are we are preparing him for the exam in 2023 or 24 that is a different 24 but then he is not being groomed to a future of 2024 but ways ahead of that now the question is do we train our children or does our education system is our education system dynamic enough to keep pace with these changes in i'm talking not about faru college i'm not even talking about calicut university i'm talking about indian education system and more so about kerala education but generally our education system is too sluggish to accept and adapt to these changes formally informally yes institutions like you probably give some kind of a supplementary uh, supplementary training supplementary inputs so that the children feel slightly more emboldened but the system as such is not preparing i should say for a very dynamic future for instance the topics that we teach in the classrooms the courses we offer and the skills that we impart they are not they are they are slightly outdated not not knowledge is not outdated but this but the skills that we impart 
are slightly incongruous with the skills that are required to steer in the 21st century. What I'm talking about is the way he writes the exam. Even today our evaluation system is a 20th century mindset evaluation system. How, whatever we say, whatever we say, the examination orientation, I'm not saying that there should be no evaluation, but then what does the, our examination system really test? His memory power. His application is never tested. His critical thinking faculty is never tested. Whether he can adapt a particular knowledge to a new situation is never tested. So the kind of evaluation in the classroom that we have today is still in the mold of 20th century. 20th century is century old now. It is very far. It is very far. 20th century is away from 21st century. Far more than 18th century is away from 19th century. The distance between 18th century and 19th century is not much. Distance between 19th century and 20th century is not much. But the distance between 20th century and 21st century is very big. So we are still, we are still uh, fostering the classrooms, the values, the attitudes, the skill sets, evaluation systems, and the administrative systems of the 20th century in our vain attempt to build the students of the 21st century, there is a mismatch. All that I said so far is only to highlight that there is a mismatch between the skills that are required for the 21st century and the kind of format, formatting that we have done in our education, even today, uh, which is a continuation of 20th century without any major changes. Tinkering here and there we have done, but that is not enough. The classroom has to change. Don't listen to me and change the classroom tomorrow. I am only saying this. But the classroom has to change. Willy nilly it will change. It has to change. The classroom, of course, there are, there are changes. The new teachers have changed. But then a teacher coming, lecturing, or giving a few uh, projects or ass assignments, and going away, transacting the curriculum or the syllabus, that day is gone, I suppose. That day is gone. So the classroom has to change. The teacher has to change. Particularly with the advent of Google and all your artificial intelligence, which can explain to you far more intelligently and coherently what he said in the syllabus, what is the function of a teacher? Function of a teacher should change. The teacher should be able, has to be Google Plus. The teacher has to be Google Plus. What Google cannot give, what ChatGPT cannot give, is what the teacher has to offer. It throws up a great challenge to the teaching community. There I think human values come in, your lateral thinking comes in, comes in. The, your ability to correlate uncorrelatable things and present a new picture to the stu student, open up new challenges. After all, what does ChatGPT, what does it do? It goes, searches so many spaces, so many areas, or domains, comes back with whatever is relevant and puts it all down. Whatever is available, it puts it in a coherent kind of format. That is not the answer. The answer has to come by synthesizing this in the, in the, in the imagination of the child. That is where the teacher has to be of that. You cannot wish away the te technologies. Technologies will be there. Even more powerful technologies will be there. Even today's newspaper, I read Google has come up with something called Gemini today, which is better than Bard which is actually giving a competition to chat GPT. So all these things will happen, you know, but then there is one thing, I'll talk about it later, there is one thing which no technology can emulate, that is creativity. Human creativity cannot be emulated or uh, it cannot, uh, technologies cannot aspire to be creative. That is because creativity is something divine. Because God, the great, is the greatest creator, greatest artist. There is no creativity bigger than God Almighty. The entire cosmos is creation. His creativity runs the entire cosmos, fills the entire cosmos. Any artist, when I, when I write a song, when I write a lyric, when I write a poem, I am only uh, being a very poor imitator of the great artist, isn't it? So there is divinity in creativity. There is divinity in creativity. When I paint a canvas of a landscape, 
I am only being a very poor imitator of the great artist that is the Almighty. Therefore, any kind of human intelligence, intelligence created technology, it cannot compete with creativity. Therefore, the challenge of 21st century is going to be how creative you can be using all these technologies. Technology is a skill. Technology is a tool. And with the technology, you can, you can um, sort of save a lot of time. Instead of browsing here and there, you, there is a technology which will bring you everything like your uh, uh, Aladdin's uh, magic lamp. Uh, the spirit will bring everything, you know, whatever you ask for. Likewise, this is the new Aladdin's, Aladdin's uh, uh, magic lamp. Chat GPT is the new magic lamp. It will bring whatever you want. But then, if you want to use it properly, your creativity, your wisdom has to come into this. Therefore, the skill that a student has to acquire in the classroom is not how to mug up and write the exam, but how to be more and more creative and interpretational, creatively interpretive, inter interpretational in his job. Therefore, that is the kind of people who are required for the 21st century. So the classroom has to change, the student has to change, the teacher has to change. And our universities have to change. There I have to spend a few minutes. A few days ago, a neighbor came to me. I don't know him, but somebody who knew me took me to him. Took me to me. Took him to me. Said that his son got an appointment in Indian Army. He has to report to Daradun three days later. When he went for interview, they said, okay, professional certificate is okay, but when if you are selected, come with the original degree certificate, then only we will let you in. So he has to report at Daradun on such and such day, three, four days later. They applied for the university, to the university for a degree certificate in BCom, which he passed in 2023 June. They said, okay, you will get the certificate by post sometime in February, March. In March 2024, you will get the certificate by post and we cannot give you in hand. That is against law, against rule. So the poor fellow came to me, not that I don't know, I, not that I, am, I have to do anything with the university, but then I took pity on him. I thought that this is a very relevant and meaningful, very, very uh, personal thing, you know, because that father is really heartbroken. He says, if my son loses his opportunity to get into the Indian Army, it will be a real pity. So I spoke to the controller of examination, who was somewhere else. He said, I'll do it, sir. You send me all the details by WhatsApp. So I sent it, send the details by WhatsApp. And by evening, he said, you ask that person to come and collect the degree certificate tomorrow. I said, may God, the merciful, <laughs> bless you all the time. So he went and collected and we went and joined the Indian Army. Now, just because he knew me, I'm not a great fellow, but I had the, I have the, what should I say, the positional importance, if I may say so, or at least the familiarity with the person who can ring up the phone. Bring up, pick up the phone and say that I have an issue, kindly help you. So he was helped. There are so many others for whom the certificate would not have been given on time. In the age of technology, why should we still linger with these systems? As soon as a result comes, can't the degree certificate be sent either by mail or by your, on your, uh, on your, uh, uh, on your fax or whatever it is, you know? There should be a system by which I should receive by email all my certificates like they do in, uh, not Georgia, but Estonia. In Estonia, they say when a child is born, the authorities will get in touch with you, saying that you are entitled for such and such amount, and your money is deposited in the bank. And your sister will generate and tell you that your child has to go to such and such school. Today is her such and such birthday, so please go and take her to the class. And the system will also tell you that this is the time for giving her such and such inoculation, injection. Everything is controlled, not controlled, facilitated by the state. If the state has to give you some money, it will be deposited in your bank account. You don't have to go and beg for it. It is your right. It is in Estonia, but the population is, I think, one-fourth of Kerala's population. Maybe, and they have a lot of money, I suppose. But then these things are also possible. You don't have to go and apply. As we write in Malayalam, you be the people of India, why should be so servile in applying for a... For, uh, for something which is, which is legally yours, which is lawfully yours. That is because we are still feudal in our attitude. So this feudal mindset is still holding sway in our activities. In universities, in government offices, everywhere. 
the citizen is a number two citizen and I sitting on the other side of the table is the number one citizen. That is weakening our democracy. These attitudes still have a lot of influence even in university systems, probably slightly more than they have in government offices. I would consider university administration half, I'll give half mark less than even government offices because it is entirely unfriendly. It is entirely unfriendly. And it is high time that technology is used effectively. The moment the result is out, I should get it on my, my WhatsApp or my email. What prevents you from get, sending your uh, 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 mark list on your uh, WhatsApp? There is no harm. But we think that, no, no, it cannot be sent. It is your problem. It is your problem because you are still living in 19th century. So this is where we are, are we preparing our students for 21st century? Where everything happens in a jiffy? So I think the classroom has to change, child has to change, teacher has to change, your syllabus has to change, your university system has to change. One last point about the university changes. A very modern topic in science, for example, which was introduced in 2010 has become obsolete in 2020. But the pace at which our syllabus changes is, is a very old system. It takes around three years for a university to change the course. By three years, your new, most new course has become most anti course, antidated. Now that is the, and the new education policy, the national education policy 2020 understands all these issues. Like a doctor who has diagnosed, who's, who is good at diagnosis, but very poor in prescription. There are certain doctors, you are a doctor. There are very good doctors who will, who will diagnose your problem very well. But then for getting your prescription, you should go somewhere else because if you, if you swallow the drugs given by that particular doctor, diagnosis is correct, but your prescription is wrong. Likewise, national education policy is like a bad doctor who is good at, good at diagnosis, but bad at prescription. The prescriptions of the national education policy are socially dangerous because it is going to create social alienation. It is an elitist policy, I should say, because it weakens the public university systems. It will take away all your, your affiliations and create autonomous colleges. This is an autonomous college. I have nothing against autonomous colleges. But everywhere is not like Kerala. Now, autonomous colleges go, are going to be created by all kinds of people at the expense of public universities. Now, there is a university, however inefficient they are, to oversee what is being done there. Now, once the affiliating system goes away from public universities, it is going to be academic anarchy in India. I have no, uh, I, don't have, I, don't, I don't fear saying this, because this, I have read this policy uh, up and down several times to, to participate in so many seminars. As I said, the diagnosis may be good, but the prescription is dangerous, I should say. Weakening public universities will create a schism in our society and encouraging private universities at the expense of public universities will create a social division by which only the rich and the upper class will be able to afford university education and the poor and socially marginalized will have to sort of be satisfied with their plus two. Are we preparing our children to meet the challenges of 21st century which is a knowledge driven society? I doubt. Let that be. It, it might take some time before national education policy fructifies fully but then we should be prepared for this kind of shocks. Okay, now the classrooms of the 21st century, why should, how should it be? Now I said about wh how, why, it, how, how, uh, there is, what, how, what kind of a mismatch there is today, I have said. But what is the ideal classroom that I have in my mind of the 21st century? Whatever be the limitations of the university or otherwise, but the, our classrooms have to change. To begin with, any, every institution can bring in the kind of academic freedom to the teachers to or train them in a special kind of pedagogy by which the student is challenged to more freedom and critical thinking. Taking the student beyond the syllabus. Now, what we are doing today is to preparing the student to write the examination in accordance with the syllabus, within the syllabus, within the confines of the syllabus. Now, syllabus, I'm not saying that you should not teach the syllabus, but we have to take him beyond the syllabus, contextualize the syllabus, make the syllabus as current as possible, and, br and bridge the gap between the syllabus and the real world. The syllabus is slightly old, the world has gone forward, and it is up to the teacher 
to sort of bridge this gap and say that the syllabus is very important but it is from here we have to walk towards this the child should know that there is a walkway from my syllabus to the present tense that is very seldom attempted because the teacher is not trained to do that the teachers would say that we don't have the time we have to cover the syllabus i think that is where new pedagogy has to be tried and teachers have to be continuously empowered by which they have to go beyond they have to prove themselves that they are better teacher than google and chat gpt they should be able to offer what technology cannot offer they have to offer what only a human being can offer they should offer and give to the child what only a teacher a teacher alone can offer that is it the uniqueness of the teacher should be felt in the classroom by every student however agile he may be about technology he may be in the forefront of technology he could think that i don't want any teachers advice everything comes to me from google but then he should feel that whatever google gives me is nothing compared to what my teacher orients that kind of a teacher is what we want in the 21st century for which institutions like yours should continuously invest in teachers uh, uh, teachers in service training programs teachers continuous training not what the university normally gives training in your administrative staff college which is called something else these days i don't understand the new term i think administrative staff college is called something else i'm slightly old in that but uh, it is not only that kind of training let it, let that go on like that but then a college like this a college of distinction like faru college should design its own training programs by which every teacher should be able to take the student forward from the confines of the syllabus to the to the horizons of today's uh, knowledge world that is that is the task of the teacher the, the student will respect only that kind of a teacher because the student will get something only from that kind of a teacher before i conclude redesigning education or there is a need and there is one more thing you see we are talking about technology all the times what is all this education for what is all this academic research for it is all for human beings it is for people solving people's problems i find one trend and tendency among the students for example migration to canada and new zealand takes place why because everybody is trying to further their prospects going there i will get a job i can live there i can settle there it is all i concentrated for what so that i can make lot of money that is all now there are hundreds of issues and problems in this country which he is not interested i think that is also another failure of our education where we have to continuously reorient our students and teaching community and and students that they are the agents or it is up to them to study earn knowledge and address the problems that our society is still facing after 75 years of independence we still have socio economic problems and who is going to solve it it is not somebody coming from outside who is going to solve it it is we the educated youth who have to solve these problems that kind of social dimension forget all about technologies technology is a tool but this kind of social uh, anchoring is something which uh, education in the 21st century really lacks and is required teacher education is important and realigning education with human values and human problems and converting education as a solution or as a search for solutions to to abiding human problems whether it is in administration whether it is in governance whether it is in supplies whether it is in uh, uh, all kinds of activities that we do even in government service everywhere there has to be a radical rethinking by realigning our knowledge to solving issues rather than perpetuating issues with a selfish mindset one last point is about research academic research i am not a great admirer of academic research which is, which is taking place in our universities mostly it is a very self centered uh, uh, enterprise so that i get a phd as prescribed by ugc that is all it is only 5% 10% people who are who are driven by the desire to learn desire to discover desire to come out with solutions that is where i originally said that when nobel prizes are appear, are announced most of the nobel prizes go to professors of universities and their research team their research associates can you imagine any college or any university in kerala doing a kind of research that will entitle them to be considered for nobel prize i think we have to think beyond phd's we have to think beyond phd's 
you please get your PhD as early as possible and concentrate on some good research. PhD, the research for PhD is only a benchmark. Real research with a social issue in mind is what research is all about. Academic community has to rededicate itself to finding solutions to social problems. There should be application research. Where else will it come from? Our administration is also bereft of this kind of data or research inputs which will make our administration better, our policies better. Our public policies have to be informed by, by high-value research, which is not coming from academic community because academic community is doing research for their PhD and postdoctoral work. That is all. It has to be, it has to be an application. It has to be, a, it has to have an application. Therefore, before I wind up, as I wind up, I should say that we are confronted with lot of opportunities as well as threats as we enter the second quarter of the 21st century. We have a great opportunity to revamp our education to meet the social and economic challenges of our people. We have a great responsibility as teachers to re-energize ourselves, to refashion ourselves, to be better teachers in the times of chat GPT and Google. And uh, we also have a responsibility to redesign our systems by which people do, do not become complacent with delays and you know conventional patterns of thinking. It is there is a mismatch how the world does its business and how Kerala does its business. I think we are still in the bureaucratic, I'm a bureaucrat, I lived 45 years as a bureaucrat, but still I say that there is a tremendous need to change our attitudes towards, towards a result-oriented result-oriented administration, result-oriented research, and future-oriented education. Therefore, let us, let us bring out the latent energy of our students, commit them to excellence and, and the research which is meant for, uh, for finding solutions. As I am fond of repeating one sentence in many of my talks, that is, true education is not about writing answers to your questions, but about questioning the answers that we hold as clear. So let us create an edu as education where comfortable answers are questioned and not about writing comfortable answers to comfortable questions, but then asking uncomfortable questions to your answers. So thank you very much, and I wish that every year we will have an opportunity. For that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. We are truly honored and delighted with your enlightening words. Thank you. Thank you once again, sir. Now, to deliver a few words, I welcome Dr. Ali Fazil, Joint Secretary, Managing Committee of Faru College. Sir, please. Good evening, everybody. Respected uh, President of the Managing Committee, Mr. P.K. Ahmed, Principal Aisha Sapna, um, the Chief Speaker or the Chief Guest, um, Jay Kumar Sir, Dr. Sayyid Yusuf Shah and his wife, I think it's Naseem Shah, Doctor. She, uh, Aisha told me that she uh, was a staff of All India Institute of Medical Sciences, retired. Uh, my colleagues in the Managing Committee, Vice President Punyaliyuka, Kutiyali Kuti sir, the other members of the staff, the members and staff of uh, the members of the committee who was there earlier, the staff members sitting here, the ex-staff members sitting here. I think it, after listening to the one-hour extempore speech by Jay Kumar sir, it is an honor uh, to stand in a podium like this on behalf of the committee. So when uh, the principal told me about this function some time back about uh, the uh, um, Professor Sayyid Mohideen Shah, I, honestly speaking, I, we didn't have much idea about the history of Mr. Shah. So I went and did some basic research and I think most of the things have been already s said here. I don't have to repeat. So I, I thought that he came at an inflection point in the uh, community at the time, 1940s. So those days, I think the issue for the community and the region was 
educating a backward community here, started by the Malawi Saab and the visionary founders of Paru College. And as the speaker, uh, Jagumar sir, told, so it was very pertinent that this, that person who was selected at the time uh, should have the right values and right vision. And I think that this is one of the reasons, if you look back, Paru College has taken over over the last 75 years. He is the gentleman who set the ball rolling. And when Aisha told me about the difficulties he had in getting salaries for staff, staff to get the college running, it makes even more uh, sacri uh, even more uh, kind of a sacrifice this gentleman had done for the college. And it is, uh, I would f say that uh, it is maybe a divine intervention or a providence that 75 years later, uh, his son and family has come here with an offer to give an endowment uh, structure and a lecture, lecture uh, capability to the college and talking about uh, the future of education. So Faru College also is at an inflection point in the sense that uh, the, most of the things have been said here. And uh, the education which was started at the time, now it has reached here. So now the college and the other colleges of this time have to look at what kind of education is important, how to educate people, and what is the future of education. I think it is important that a question to be answered. And most of the questions have been answered by uh, Dr. Jay Kumar. So I was wondering whether somebody has uh, recorded his speech. It can be even kept in a TED talk to the younger generation of teachers. And I found it one of the most elaborate, deep subject knowledge speech which I've heard for a long time, sir. I think it's, it's an honor to listen to a speech like that. Excellent speech. And I, I could see that nobody even moved from the seat when you were talking. I hope that one day you can come and address the managing committee of Faru College and guide us how to take the education process in this institution forward. Thank you so much. And I think uh, that the time is getting late. I would like to thank the principal, the two department, I think one is the English department and chemistry department who were instrumental in organizing such a uh, activity here. And I hope and pray that one thing I'm sure that the, the speakers who will come behind you will find it difficult to match such a, such a kind of speech what you're given here, endowment what you're given. I'm pretty sure about that. Because I've never heard a speech like this in my life about education, the future, the hard truths about the universities, what is going on here. I think, sir, I think you should continue to ad address us like this. And thank you all. Thank the organizers, all the people who have been sitting here uh, patiently listening to the thing and I wish Faru College will go to the direction guided by the speaker here and thanks once again um, I, I was also looking at the CV of uh, Mr. Yusuf Saiz Shah so I was also shocked that uh, you had so much of uh, degrees no I think you had a double masters then you were you were uh, uh, working in the NCRT initially then from there you went for adult education, which was very important in those days. And I think he has started his own education portal. Basically, I think the stress is on adult education. I don't know much about you, ma'am, of, of which department you were in. Okay, All India Institute. So both are educational. I think it kudos to the man, the sons have been uh, following in the footsteps of the illustrious fa father. And I also feel that we should all honor the, uh, the first principal who has done so much for the college. I personally, on behalf of myself and the managing committee, we all should honor the gentleman who has done so much for the college and to the family who is trying to continue the legacy here. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Now, to address the gathering, I welcome Dr. Saeed Yusuf Shah, son of Professor Saeed Mohideen Shah, the Director, International Institute of Adult and Lifelong Education, Delhi. Sir, please. Very good evening. Dignitaries on the dais, faculty member past and present of Farooq College, my friends and students. I deem it a great privilege and pleasure to participate in today's program, which has been organized in such a meticulous, well-thought-out way 
and got a very eminent speaker who opened our eyes. Although I am in the field of education, many points we said is so relevant and useful to be further disseminated among youth today. My father would be very happy if he is seen from above listening to his speech because many of the issues for which he worked in his time was he has raised those issues. Then I was asking my wife, what am I supposed to say? I, I came here just to participate and return to speak. She said, okay, everything would have been said about your father. You say son's perspective about your father, your experiences with your father. So that took me, you know, I have observed two things. When I was a child, there is a, you know, every day when I come from school to home, there will be somebody sitting in veranda talking to father. One time it may be some Hindu sannyasi saints, some other time it was Christian priests, some other time it was Maulimis. So every time intermittently I see his discussion with different religious leaders and others. So then one day he took me to a temple, Sri Narayana temple, which is near to our home. But there in the campus there used to be several programs are being organized. So Sri Narayana statue was there. So I asked, who is this? Then he said, okay. There was a bookstall selling books on Sri Narayana. He purchased a book and gave to me. You read about it and you will know yourself. So it was about 100 pages book. I read same night. Next day morning breakfast, he asked me, what? You tell me only one sentence that has struck to you. So I said, I remember one sentence which greatly appealed to me. He said, Madha Medha Elum Manishan Nanayal Madhi. Whatever may be the religion, person should be good. So that, that was a great thing to me, you know. Then, then I realized because he was trying to understand different religions, their cultures, and he continuously involved in promoting interpersonal harmony among different religions, communal harmony. This was very close to his heart, apart from his educational endeavors and his speeches. Then second thing, she said, as a father, how did I find? Compared to my, myself as a father and my contemporaries as father, how do they supervise their children. One of my friends, who is a secretary to government of India, his children, both children are doing their graduation. He is so much stressed about their assignment, he will read their books, you know, dictate their things, something which he cannot understand. He needs a summary of 400 pages. He will tell me, can you help me? So I will ask chat GPT and get a summary and send to him. You know, so both brother and sisters, they are twins. They were in the same class. So when they wrote the answer, the uh, professor called them. How is your answer too similar? You co copied each other. He said, no, no, they were, they were sitting far off. Then they said, yeah, we are brother and sister, twins. We stay, do combined studies. But still he said, this seems to be taken from some source. So instead of A, he gave them only B+. Plus. You know, so teacher knew that it has come from chat GPT and that thing. So, you know, today's parents are so much concerned about their children's education. They don't allow them to take their own decision and study, like helicopter parenting, you know. He will be always there, you know, whether he's studying, going around, telling them. He's a student of BA. But, so I compare my father. He was a, you know, regular visitor, frequent visitor, because his job was transferable. He goes from one college to another. So my mother and my family stayed in Trichur. So we never moved with him. Whenever he comes, he will just say, how is your studies? Good, do well. He will never say, show me your answer. Have you written this? Have you got this thing? No. He said, you take your own decision. You must study well. Neither my mother interfered. So those days, I asked my friends. None of their parents took so much interest in education of their children. We studied of our own and we passed also. So this is the difference those days and today's year. Then he never interfered in decisions. You know, after my graduation, I did BSc in Government Brennan College, Delhi Theory. I wanted to go to Aligarh to do master's degree. That time, result came from Kerala University was very late, so I could not apply. So there was one year I had to wait. So he said, you must use the time effectively. What courses are there for one year? There is a BA course. Okay, Farooq Training College is there. So I know the principal. I will give a letter to Professor Shukur and Professor Jalil. You go. So I took a train from Trichur, came here, met them. They said, okay, our seats are all full, but management has a quota and we will give you one seat. So in management quota, I did BA from Farooq College. That year I stayed in the campus, stayed in the hotel. That was a, you, that library was also very good. So I used to sit most of the time in the college library and reading room. So that is my association with Farooq College. Then we decided we must do something in memory of our father. So we established a Shah Foundation in Trishur. 
my nephew professor sayed jalaluddin shah he is a professor of civil engineering in ms college kutipuram he could not come today so he is the president of the shah foundation they are planning to do something since my father used to give several oration lectures and organize seminars so we thought we must start with a oration lecture what is the best place to do where is the college he spent seven years that is how so as soon as i told i i did not have much contact i shared my interest with professor khader who was a friend of last 50 years so he said don't worry i will do something so he moved the fingers and i gave the contact details of the principal professor dr aisha sapna and then she immediately reacted i am very happy that college yeah, yeah and actually the person who really helped was dr munawar khader's wife because who happened to know her so both of them moved you know fingers and this program was well organized i am also equally happy that you, they got a speaker of stature of you know today's speaker his speech was really worth it should as i told it should be on some uh, ted talk it could be recorded it can be speech can be uploaded on ted talk so that youngsters need to listen who are doing phd who are keen to do research you know they, these days research has become is that they cut and google it this page that page and make a thesis and many organizations are there you pay this money well written thesis degrees here so that is very eye opener speech for research so these are some of the things i want to share i hope these things will continue more of such activities will happen thank you very much for giving us a chance thank you thank you sir now for a few words i welcome professor kutiyali kuti former principal of faru college sir please good evening esteemed guest of this program dr k jay kumar sir president of the faru college managing committee then up pk ahmed sahib sayed mohideen shah's son dr sayed yusuf shah and his family all the members of the faru college managing committee my dear teachers former teachers and students oru maatathinu vendi naan i am going to switch off switch on to malayalam innathe aadhuniga sugha saugaryangal ubhayogichukonde vidyabhyasam nadathi varunna nammude kuttigal kore per ivide irikkunnu avarku ഈ കോളേജ് നടന്നു വന്ന വഴി എന്താണെന്ന് പറഞ്ഞു കൊടുക്കേണ്ട ആവശ്യകത ഉണ്ട് എന്നുള്ളത് കൊണ്ട് പ്രൊഫസർ സെയ്ദ് മൊയ്തീൻ ഷാ സാറിനെ കുറിച്ച് കുറച്ച് കാര്യങ്ങൾ പറയാൻ ഞാൻ ബാധ്യസ്ഥനാണ് സെയ്ദ് മൊയ്തീൻ ഷാ ആയിരത്തി തൊള്ളായിരത്തി നാൽപ്പത്തി എട്ടിൽ ഫറൂഖ് കോളേജ് തുടങ്ങാനെടുത്ത തീരുമാനം അത് നടപ്പിലാകുന്നതോടുകൂടി മലബാറിലെ ഒരു പുതിയ വിദ്യാഭ്യാസ വിപ്ലവത്തിന് തിരികെ കൊളുത്തുകയായിരുന്നു ആയിരത്തി തൊള്ളായിരത്തി നാൽപ്പത്തി എട്ട് ഓഗസ്റ്റ് അഞ്ചാം തീയതിയാണ് അന്നത്തെ കോളേജ് മാനേജിംഗ് കമ്മിറ്റി മെമ്പർമാർ ഈ കോളേജിന് ആര് പ്രിൻസിപ്പളാണെന്നതിനെക്കുറിച്ചുള്ള കാര്യബോധത്തോടെയുള്ള ഒരു ആലോചനക്കൊടുവിൽ സെയ്ദ് മൊയ്തീൻ ഷാ എന്ന വ്യക്തിയെ ഫറൂഖ് കോളേജിലെ പ്രിൻസിപ്പലായിട്ട് കൊണ്ടുവരണം കൊണ്ടുവരണമെന്നൊരു തീരുമാനം എടുത്തത് അന്ന് സെയ്ദ് മൊയ്തീൻ ഷാ സാർ സ്കൂൾ അധ്യാപകനായതിന് ശേഷം ഗവൺമെൻറ് കോളേജിൽ അധ്യാപകനായിരുന്നു അദ്ദേഹത്തിന് അഞ്ച് വർഷം കാലത്തെ ഡെപ്യൂട്ടേഷനിലാണ് ഫറൂഖ് കോളേജിൽ പ്രിൻസിപ്പലായിട്ട് നിയമിച്ചത് ആയിരത്തി ശരിക്ക് പറഞ്ഞാൽ ആയിരത്തി തൊള്ളായിരത്തി നാൽപ്പത്തി എട്ട് ഓഗസ്റ്റ് പന്ത്രണ്ടാം തീയതിയാണ് ഫറൂഖ് കോളേജിൽ ഫറൂഖ് കോളേജ് നിലവിൽ വന്നത് എപ്പോഴും ഇപ്പോൾ നമ്മുടെ മുഖ്യാതിഥി ഇവിടെ പറയുകയുണ്ടായി ഒരു സ്ട്രക്ചറിൻ്റെ സ്ട്രെങ്ത്ത് അളക്കുന്നത് അല്ലെങ്കിൽ ഡിറ്റേമെൻ ചെയ്യുന്നത് അതിൻ്റെ ഫൗണ്ടേഷൻ എത്ര കണ്ട് ശക്തമാണോ അതനുസരിച്ചാണെന്ന് പറയുകയുണ്ടായി ഞങ്ങളുടെ ഒക്കെ അനുഭവത്തിൽ തികച്ചും അത് നൂറ് ശതമാനം ശരിയാണെന്ന് തീരുമാനമുണ്ട് ഉറപ്പുണ്ട് 
ഞാൻ ഈ കോളേജിൻ്റെ പത്താമത്തെ പ്രിൻസിപ്പലായി ഏഴ് വർഷം ഇരുന്ന ആളാണ് ഒരു ടീച്ചറുടെ ഏറ്റവും പ്രത്യേകത എന്ത് വെച്ചാൽ ഒബ്സേർവർ ആവണം എന്നുള്ളതാണ് കഴിഞ്ഞ കാലങ്ങളിലേക്ക് തിരിഞ്ഞു നോക്കിയപ്പോൾ എന്തുകൊണ്ട് ഫറൂഖ് കോളേജ് എല്ലാ കാലത്തും ഉന്നതങ്ങളിൽ നിന്നും ഉന്നതങ്ങളിലേക്ക് പോകുന്നു എന്നുള്ളത് അന്വേഷിച്ച് നോക്കിയപ്പോൾ മനസ്സിലായത് ഓരോ കാലഘട്ടത്തിലെയും ഈ കോളേജിന് നേതൃത്വം കൊടുത്തവർ ഏറ്റവും വലിയ അടയാളപ്പെടുത്തുകല് നടത്തിയിട്ടുള്ളവരാണ് എന്ന് മനസ്സിലാക്കാൻ കഴിഞ്ഞിട്ടുണ്ട് അതിൽ ഏറ്റവും പരമപ്രധാനമായ ഒരു സ്ഥാനമാണ് നമ്മുടെ പ്രൊഫസർ സെയ്ദ് മൊയ്തീൻ ഷാ സാറിന് ഉള്ളത് മൊയ്തീൻ ഷാ സാർ ഒരു സാധാരണ ചില്ലിൻ്റെ കൂട്ടിലിരുന്നു കൊണ്ട് അഡ്മിനിസ്ട്രേഷൻ നടത്തിയിരുന്ന ഒരു പ്രിൻസിപ്പൾ ആയിരുന്നില്ല കോളേജ് തുടങ്ങിയത് രണ്ട് കിലോമീറ്റർ അപ്പുറമുള്ള മൂന്നിലകം എന്ന ഒരു തറവാട്ട് വീട്ടിലായിരുന്നു ഫറൂഖ് കോളേജിൻ്റെ അന്നത്തെ ആദ്യത്തെ ട്രഷറർ ആയിരുന്ന ജനാബ് കെ ഇസ്മായിൽ സാഹിബിൻ്റെ വീട്ടിലാണ് കോളേജ് തുടങ്ങിയിട്ടുള്ളത് ഒരു വർഷത്തിന് ശേഷമാണ് ഈ കോളേജിന് പുതിയ ബിൽഡിങ്ങൊക്കെ ഈ സംവിധാനങ്ങൾ ഈ കോളേജിലേക്ക് വന്നത് അതിനുശേഷം നമുക്കറിയാം ഇന്ന് കാണുന്ന കോളേജിൻ്റെ മൊത്തം ഇൻഫ്രാസ്ട്രക്ചർ പരിശോധിച്ചാൽ ബിൽഡിങ്ങുകളുടെ കാര്യം എടുക്കുകയാണെങ്കിൽ ഏതാണ്ട് അൻപത് ശതമാനത്തിലേറെയും ബിൽഡിങ്ങുകൾ ആ കാലഘട്ടത്തിൽ പണിതതാണ് അപ്പോൾ ഷാ സാഹിബിനെ കുറിച്ച് പറയുമ്പോൾ മനസ്സിലാക്കിയത് അദ്ദേഹം കുറച്ച് സമയം ഓഫീസിലിരിക്കും അടുത്ത മിനിറ്റ് ഓടുന്നത് ഇവിടുത്തെ കാർപ്പൻറ്റേഴ്സിൻ്റെ വർക്ക്ഷോപ്പിലേക്കാണ് അവിടെ അൻപതോ അറുപതോ കാർപ്പൻറ്റേഴ്സ് ഒരേ സമയത്ത് വർക്ക് ചെയ്യുന്നവരാണ് അതേപോലെ ഈ കോളേജിൻ്റെ ബിൽഡിങ്ങിന് ഒക്കെ ആവശ്യമുള്ള കല്ല് വെട്ടിയെടുത്തത് ഇപ്പോഴത്തെ നമ്മളെ കൺവെൻഷൻ സെൻറ്ററിൻ്റെ അടുത്തുള്ള പാറ ഉണ്ടായിരുന്നൊരു സ്ഥലമാണ് അതിൽ നിന്ന് നമ്മൾ കൺവെൻഷൻ സെൻറ്ററായിട്ട് മാറ്റിയിരിക്കുകയാണ് അവിടെ കല്ല് വെട്ടുന്ന തൊഴിലാളികൾ ധാരാളം ഉണ്ടായിരുന്നു അവിടെ പോയി അവരെ നിയന്ത്രിക്കുകയും അവിടുത്തെ കാര്യങ്ങൾ ഏറ്റെടുക്കുകയും ചെയ്യുക എന്നുള്ള ഒരു ഭാരിച്ച ഉത്തരവാദിത്വം കൂടി ഷാ സാഹിബിനുണ്ടായിരുന്നു കേരളത്തിൽ കോളേജ് അധ്യാപകർക്ക് ഗവൺമെൻറ് ശമ്പളം കൊടുക്കാൻ തുടങ്ങിയത് ആയിരത്തി തൊള്ളായിരത്തി എഴുപത്തി രണ്ടിലെ ഡയറക്റ്റ് പേയ്മെൻറ്റ് അഗ്രിമെൻറ്റിന് ശേഷമാണ് അതിൻ്റെ മുൻകാലങ്ങളിലൊക്കെ തന്നെയും മാനേജ്മെൻറ്റുകൾ അവർ പണം സമാഹരിച്ചുകൊണ്ട് അതിൽ നിന്നുമാണ് ചെറിയൊരു തുക ഗവൺമെൻറ്റിൽ നിന്നും ഗ്രാൻഡായിട്ട് കിട്ടുമായിരുന്നുവെങ്കിലും ആ കൃത്യസമയത്ത് ലഭിക്കാത്തത് കൊണ്ടും ആവശ്യമുള്ള പണം കിട്ടാത്തത് കൊണ്ടും ഈ തരത്തിലുള്ള പിരിവെടുത്തുകൾ നടത്തിക്കൊണ്ടാണ് കോളേജ് നടത്തിക്കൊണ്ടുപോയിരുന്നത് നമ്മുടെ കോളേജും അതിൽ നിന്ന് ഒട്ടും വിഭിന്നമായിരുന്നില്ല അതിൽ ഷാ സാഹിബ് ഒരുപാട് പ്രയാസങ്ങൾ അനുഭവിച്ചിട്ടുണ്ട് ആദ്യം അഞ്ച് വർഷമായിരുന്നു അദ്ദേഹത്തിൻ്റെ ഡെപ്യൂട്ടേഷൻ കാലാവധിയെങ്കിലും രണ്ട് പീരീഡിൽ ഓരോ വർഷം കൂടി അദ്ദേഹത്തിന് ഡെപ്യൂട്ടേഷൻ ഗവൺമെൻറ് നീട്ടിക്കൊടുക്കുകയും ആയിരത്തി തൊള്ളായിരത്തി അൻപത്തി അഞ്ചിന് ഡെപ്യൂട്ടേഷൻ കാലാവധി കഴിഞ്ഞ് അദ്ദേഹം പുറത്തു പോവുകയും സോറി അദ്ദേഹത്തിൻ്റെ ഹോം കോളേജിലേക്ക് തിരിച്ചു പോവുകയാണ് ഉണ്ടായിട്ടുള്ളത് പ്രിൻസിപ്പലിൻ്റെ കസാലയിൽ നിന്ന് നോക്കുമ്പോൾ എന്തുകൊണ്ട് ഞങ്ങൾക്ക് ഇത്ര ശക്തിയോടുകൂടി ധൈര്യമായി കോളേജിനെ മുന്നോട്ട് നയിക്കാൻ പറ്റുന്നു എന്ന് നോക്കുമ്പോഴാണ് ജയകുമാർ സാർ പറഞ്ഞ ഫൗണ്ടേഷൻ്റെ ഒരു ചരിത്രത്തിലേക്ക് കണ്ണോടിക്കാൻ ഞങ്ങളൊക്കെ പ്രേരിപ്പിച്ച വസ്തുത വളരെ സ്ട്രോങ് ഫൗണ്ടേഷൻ ആയിരുന്നു ഞങ്ങളതിനെ ഫൗണ്ടേഷൻ എന്ന് പറയില്ല ടേക്ക് ഓഫ് അത്രയും ശക്തമായിരുന്നു കാരണം ഒരു എയർക്രാഫ്റ്റിൻ്റെ അതിൻ്റെ സ്പീഡും ബാക്കിയുള്ള വേഗതയൊക്കെ നിയന്ത്രിക്കുന്നത് നിശ്ചയിക്കുന്നത് അതിൻ്റെ ടേക്ക് ഓഫിൻ്റെ ശക്തിയാണ് ഫറൂഖ് കോളേജിൻ്റെ സ്റ്റേക്ക് ഓഫ് വളരെ സ്ട്രെങ്ത് ഉള്ളതായിരുന്നു വളരെ സ്ട്രോങ് ആയിരുന്നു അത്രയും വലിയൊരു സപ്പോർട്ട് നാട്ടുകാരിൽ നിന്നും കോളേജ് മാനേജിംഗ് കമ്മിറ്റി അംഗങ്ങളിൽ നിന്നും പല പ്രദേശത്തുള്ള ആൾക്കാരിൽ നിന്നും ഇങ്ങനൊരു കോളേജ് വരുന്നത് കേട്ടതോടുകൂടി ഉണ്ടായിട്ടുണ്ട് അപ്പോൾ അതിനെല്ലാം സമാഹരിച്ചുകൊണ്ട് കൂട്ടിയോജിപ്പിച്ചുകൊണ്ട് മൗലാന അബു സബാഹ് അഹമ്മദ് അലി സാഹിബിൻ്റെ കൂടെ അറബി കോളേജ് ഇവിടെ ആദ്യം വന്നൊരു കോളേജാണ് പിന്നീടാണ് ഫറൂഖ് കോളേജ് എന്ന ആർട്സ് ആൻഡ് സയൻസ് കോളേജ് വന്നതെങ്കിലും രണ്ടിനെയും കൂടി ഒന്നിച്ച് സമന്വയിപ്പിച്ചുകൊണ്ട് മലബാറിൽ തന്നെ ഏറ്റവും വലിയൊരു വിദ്യാഭ്യാസ സ്ഥാപനമായി മാറ്റുന്നതിൽ സമുദായ സ്നേഹികളുടെയും ഇവിടെയുള്ള വിദ്യാഭ്യാസ തൽപരുടെയൊക്കെ സഹായത്തോടു കൂടിയും സപ്പോർട്ടോടു കൂടിയാണ് ഇങ്ങനെ നടന്നിട്ടുള്ളത് ഇങ്ങനെ ഈ കോളേജ് ഈ ലെവലിലേക്ക് എത്താൻ
തികച്ചും സൂക്ഷ്മതയോടു കൂടി വെച്ച അല്ലെങ്കിൽ ശക്തമായി വെച്ചിട്ടുള്ളൊരു സ്റ്റെപ്പായിരുന്നു എന്നുള്ളത് വായിച്ചെടുക്കാൻ ഒരു പ്രയാസവുമില്ല ഈ ഒരു ചടങ്ങ് കോളേജിൻ്റെ പൂർവകാല ചരിത്രത്തെ ചരിത്രത്തിലേക്ക് തിരിഞ്ഞു നോക്കാനും ഇന്ന് സുഖ സൗകര്യങ്ങൾ അനുഭവിച്ചു കൊണ്ടിരിക്കുന്ന നമ്മുടെ ഇപ്പോഴത്തെ വിദ്യാർത്ഥികൾക്ക് കഴിഞ്ഞ കാലത്തെക്കുറിച്ച് മനസ്സിലാക്കാനും എന്തുമാത്രം ത്യാഗം നമ്മുടെ പൂർവികർ സഹിച്ചിട്ടുണ്ട് എന്നുള്ളത് മനസ്സിലാക്കാനുള്ളൊരു അവസരമാണ് ഒരുക്കി തന്നിട്ടുള്ളത് ഇതിന് നേതൃത്വം മുൻ മുൻകൈയ്യെടുത്ത ഷാ സാഹിബിൻ്റെ കുടുംബത്തെ ആദ്യമായി പ്രിൻസിപ്പൾ എന്ന നിലക്ക് പ്രിൻസിപ്പളുടെ പ്രതിനിധി എന്ന നിലക്ക് ഞാൻ അവരെ മുക്തകണ്ഠം പ്രശംസിക്കുകയാണ് മറ്റൊരു കാര്യം ഡോക്ടർ അലി ഫൈസൽ സാഹിബ് പറഞ്ഞ പോലെ ഇത്ര എൻലൈറ്റൻഡ് ആയിട്ട് ഒരു സ്പീച്ച് അടുത്ത കാലത്തൊന്നും വിദ്യാഭ്യാസ പ്രവർത്തകൻ എന്നുള്ള നിലക്ക് ഞാൻ പല എൻ ഇ പിയുമായി ബന്ധപ്പെട്ട ന്യൂ എഡ്യൂക്കേഷൻ പോളിസിയുമായിട്ടുള്ള ഒരുപാട് സെമിനാറുകളിലൊക്കെ പഠിത്തിട്ടുണ്ട് സർ ഇതുപോലെയുള്ള ഒരു എൻലൈറ്റ് ആയിട്ടുള്ള ഒരു സ്പീച്ച് ഒരു ഇൻഫർമാറ്റീവ് ടോക്ക് ഞങ്ങൾക്ക് എവിടെ നിന്നും കിട്ടിയിട്ടില്ല അതുകൊണ്ട് ഈ ക്യാമ്പസിൽ പത്ത് സ്ഥാപനങ്ങളുണ്ട് ഈ പത്ത് സ്ഥാപനങ്ങളിലേക്കും ഈ പുതിയ എഡ്യൂക്കേഷൻ പോളിസി ബാധകമായതുകൊണ്ട് തന്നെ ഞങ്ങൾ സാറിനെ അടുത്ത് തന്നെ സമീപിക്കുന്നതാണ് ഈ ഇതിൻ്റെ അഡ്മിനിസ്ട്രേറ്റേഴ്സ് പത്ത് സ്ഥാപനങ്ങൾക്കും പത്ത് കമ്മിറ്റികളുണ്ട് റൗദത്തുള്ള അസോസിയേഷന് കീഴിൽ പത്ത് സ്ഥാപനങ്ങളുണ്ട് കെ ജി മുതൽ റിസർച്ച് സെൻ്റർ വരെ നമ്മുടെ ഈ ക്യാമ്പസിൽ ഐ എ എസ് കോച്ചിങ് സെൻ്റർ വരെ ഇവിടെ ഉണ്ട് അപ്പോൾ അവർക്ക് എല്ലാവരും കൂടി ഒന്നിച്ചുകൊണ്ട് മാനേജിങ് കമ്മിറ്റി മെമ്പർമാർക്കും അധ്യാപകർക്കും മറ്റ് ജീവനക്കാർക്കൊക്കെ ഇതേപോലെയുള്ള ഒരു കണ്ടിന്യൂസ് ആയിട്ടുള്ളൊരു സീരീസ് ഓഫ് ടോക്ക് അത് ഉണ്ടാവുകയാണെങ്കിൽ തികച്ചും ഇന്ത്യയുടെ സാറ് പറഞ്ഞ ഒരുപാട് കാര്യങ്ങൾ നമുക്ക് മനസ്സിലായി അവസാനം എത്തി നിൽക്കുന്നത് നമ്മൾ എങ്ങോട്ട് എന്തുകൊണ്ട് കുട്ടികൾ ന്യൂസിലൻഡിലേക്കും ഓസ്ട്രേലിയയിലേക്കും കാനഡയിലൊക്കെ മാറിപ്പോകുന്നു വിദ്യാഭ്യാസത്തിന് വേണ്ടി ഇത്രയും വലിയൊരു തുക കേരള ഇന്ത്യ ഗവൺമെൻറ് കുട്ടികളുടെ വിദ്യാഭ്യാസ ചെലവിന് ചെലവഴിച്ചിട്ട് ഇതൊക്കെ ഉപേക്ഷിച്ച് പോകുന്നു എന്തുകൊണ്ട് അവരുടെ പിന്നീടുള്ള സേവനം എന്തുകൊണ്ട് നമുക്ക് ലഭിക്കുന്നില്ല ഇതിനൊക്കെയുള്ള ഒരു മറുപടി സരിത് കിട്ടി കൃത്യമായിട്ടും അത് കിട്ടണമെങ്കിൽ നമ്മുടെ ഇവിടുത്തെ ആൾക്കാർക്ക് തന്നെ കൃത്യമായ ഒരു അവബോധം ഈ കാര്യത്തിൽ ഉണ്ടാകേണ്ടിയിരിക്കുന്നു സാറിൻ്റെ എല്ലാവിധ സഹകരണങ്ങളും ഉണ്ടാകണമെന്ന് റൗദത്തൊലിലും അസോസിയേഷൻ്റെ സെക്രട്ടറി എന്ന നിലക്ക് വിനീതമായി അപേക്ഷിക്കുകയാണ് സാർ ഇതിന് കളം വേദി ഒരുക്കിയ ഫറൂഖ് കോളേജ് പ്രിൻസിപ്പൽ മാനേജിംഗ് കമ്മിറ്റി അംഗങ്ങൾ മറ്റേ ജോളജി ഇംഗ്ലീഷ് ഡിപ്പാർട്ട്മെൻറ്റ് കെമിസ്ട്രി ഡിപ്പാർട്ട്മെൻറ്റ് ഷാ സാഹിബിൻ്റെ കുടുംബം ഇവരോട് എല്ലാവരോടുള്ള അകമഴിഞ്ഞ കടപ്പാട് അറിയിച്ചുകൊണ്ട് ഞാൻ അവസാനിപ്പിക്കുന്നു ജയ് ഹിന്ദ് താങ്ക് യു താങ്ക് യു സർ നൗ ഐ വെൽക്കം മിസ്റ്റർ മുഹമ്മദ് ജിയാദ് ഹെഡ് ഇൻ ചാർജ് ഡിപ്പാർട്ട്മെൻറ്റ് ഓഫ് കെമിസ്ട്രി ഫോർ വോട്ട് ഓഫ് താങ്ക്സ് respected dignitaries retired teachers faculty members staff students and the members from the faru college community on behalf of the faru college committee i extend my heartfelt thanks to each and every one for gracing this momentous occasion of the endowment lecture with your presence first and foremost i would like to express our sincere appreciation to the late sayed mohammad shah the first principal of faru college whose vision and dedication laid the foundation for this prestigious institution we pay tribute to the, to his memory and the lasting impact he has had on the college i would like to express my deepest gratitude to our chief guest retired ias officer jay kumar sir for sharing his valuable insights your speech has has been enlightening and inspire us to excel in our academic pursuits a special thanks to said yusuf shah the son of the first principal of faru college for sponsoring this endowment lecture your contribution is commendable and we are privileged to have you here today your com- commitment and support in education and creating opportunities for the intellectual growth is truly commendable i extend my heartfelt thanks to pk ahmed the president of the management committee for gracing the occasion i would like to express our heartfelt gratitude to the management committee members mr k v kunyamath koya dr ali faizal for their valuable presence and 
for the constant support in fostering an, an, an environment of excellence in education. I extend my sincere thanks and appreciation to Principal Dr. Aisha Sapna for guiding the organizing committee in every aspect. Thank you, ma'am. Your guidance and vision inspire us to navigate the future of education with purpose and innovation. A warm thank you to the former principals and all the retired teachers who have chosen to grace us with their presence today. Your presence here today not only honor the memory of Syed Mohyuddin Shah, the first principal of Faru College, but also symbolizes your ongoing commitment to the values of education and intellectual discourse. I extend my sincere thanks to Ms. Naseem Shah for honoring us with their presence. Last but not the least, I would like to express my heartfelt thanks to the organizing committee, to the staff, and other uh, officials of the college, students, for being uh, present over this function. Thank you all. Thank you, sir, and thank you, everyone. National Anthem. <laughs>